thanks very much, Lorna. So um, hello, everybody. I'm Connor, as she said, I am um, lecturing in Trinity, but I'm also a um, English teacher and I do that um, in schools and uh, my own um, teaching as well, corporate English and um, other types of English. So this will be basically looking at the diversity of, of the English language, uh, which will complement somebody teaching English as a second language. It runs alongside it. There are some um, differences in approach. So I'll open the slides. Introduction, English dialectology. So from the starting point, dialects, we think everybody speaks at least one dialect and perhaps loads, uh, maybe other languages. So in common use, here's a quote uh, from one of the books, which is on the reading list by Chambers and Trudgehill. So in common use, people say a dialect is a substandard, low status, often from the countryside, um, people lacking in prestige. But actually, that's not true. When we're talking about a dialect in linguistic terms, it's just non-standard. But when you look at all the languages around, everybody speaks at one dialect. The standard English and other standard languages is just one dialect amongst many. And historically, it became the standard, perhaps because it was associated with the capital city area or people in charge and things like that. And you had standardization processes over time. But the other dialects continue to be spoken and people speak them to greater or lesser extent. So we can't say one dialect is better or worse. It's just spoken maybe in different circumstances or in different areas, etc. So having said that, how does this affect the study of grammar? And what kinds of grammar are there anyway? So one thing which people used to think of with grammar was prescriptive, which was telling native speakers how to speak correctly. So somebody might say, who do you want to talk to or to boldly go? Boldly go uh, is a quote from Star Trek. And some purists and prescriptivists would say, this is actually wrong. You should say, to whom do you wish to speak? It's got whom there with the M. And also, to whom needs to exist together. You can't split that. And also, to go boldly. You shouldn't split the infinitive. Uh, and one of the reasons for that was the study of Latin. People used to think Latin was this uh, exemplar of um, grammar and syntax. And if you can't split one word, ire, which means to go, then you shouldn't do it in English. People don't normally think this is true now. You can't really say, if people speak a certain way, you can't really say it's wrong. So we don't normally talk about prescriptivism as the main focus. But uh, style guides, if you're ever writing for a, um, a journal or something, if they say they prefer you to use whom or they prefer this style, that's what you go with. You know, if you're writing your academic papers, there's certain styles that people prefer, but that's only a preference. And then pedagogical grammars, which is what you guys uh, are interested in, teaching to non-native speakers. So if you're talking about grammar, very, very simply, obviously the plural, one book, two books, and agreement with person, I go, she goes. Fine, that's what you would teach. But in Irish English dialects, uh, people say, that's five year ago. Um, there's no S there. Or, me brother come home last summer for the wedding. So they're using me instead of my, uh, come instead of came, and not even comes home last summer for the wedding. But that's fine, and communities would, would say that. It's not found in a standard English textbook. You wouldn't teach it. If you went to live in an area where people spoke that dialect, that would be grand. But there's good reasons to say, teach the standard first. So anything that I'm going to follow in this class is not to say that's what you should teach. And certainly mixing dialects could end up quite uh, confusing. But you will hear sometimes if you're talking to people, uh, Irish people, you might hear this. And just this class will explain why. You wouldn't find it in a standard textbook, but they're regularly used. So we can talk about certain Irish English dialects. And then la lastly, descriptive grammars, which is what people tend to do now if they're not teaching um, as a second language. If they're just describing the grammar, they go out there, they talk, they listen, they read to what people are actually doing. So they're not going with anything that one is better, it's just another thing spoken in a certain area. So this is a quote by Jesperson, going quite far back, but it's quite um, central to it. Uh, English grammar is not stiff, dogmatic precepts. These are not rules that had to be never changing. 
right and wrong, but something living and developed. So language changes. Even if you read a book from 100 years ago, it's slightly different. Continual fluctuations and undulations. The past, obviously, is the founding of it, but it prepares, it moves forward, always, never completely finished, progressing, basically human. We need to talk about new things. Um, people move around. Things just change anyway. So that's why if you try to read Middle English, you might find it difficult because language has changed. And dialects are just areas where people speak slightly differently uh, from the standard. So if you think about the language, the English language, uh, an L2 learner would say, OK, you're speaking English naturally and grammatically, as well as writing conventions, which is great, um, based on standards and conventions developed over time. But when you listen to how people are actually talking and writing, it's not spoken exactly the same way by everybody. It's actually very varied, even by one person. So a person speaks. Obviously, they're an individual, but it's usually not in isolation. They're in a different context or situation. So that person might be with their friends, in which case they might talk very informally or family. With work colleagues, they might be slightly more formal. Uh, strangers, they could be very polite. Uh, and the society and communities you live will affect the ways in which you speak and write. So a whole community might have a dialect, but people within it have various choices they might make. So here are some varieties before we talk about dialect. The idiolect is everybody speaks slightly differently. So you have your own personal dialect. Register uh, is social situations. Are you talking science, legal, informal, different registers with different uh, people in your life, basically. And then style is the individual variation, but you have a massive range of choices of words and styles you want to use. And you can select these words depending. And that's what poets do. They've got lots of words. Everybody does. And you might say, I'll choose this word or that word in a certain situation. Uh, jargon would be more, well, jargon would be within register. Jargon is the particular words themselves which are required. And jargon mightn't be understood by people outside that industry and professions, yes. So a scientist needs a lot of words, particularly for the science that they are using, that somebody who isn't in that area wouldn't understand. And the register would include um, other things as well, like maybe the grammar. Um, but within that, they can get mixed up, yeah, and sometimes they're used differently by different um, groups of people, like the word um, fish could be used differently from a, by a scientist and by a cook, for example, depending on what the, um, the situation or register, who basically, the social situation, who you were talking to. So the scientists can go home and talk in a different way than when they're talking at work. So then we have all of those different varieties because it's constantly um, variable. Uh, so the dialect is an abstraction. Can we say, can we lump all of these varieties together and get some sort of overall pattern? Now, normally people think of a dialect as a map. So there's a map. We'll talk about Isaac Glosses later, but England, and it's sort of split into general areas. It's actually very, very fuzzy and vague. Those boundaries are only guidelines. But that's what you might say, north of England, London, west of England, etc. Then socioeconomic, uh, people might live in the same area, but depending on um, the socioeconomic class, they might speak slightly differently. And then temporal, if you can do it in space, why not do it in time? So could you have somebody talking in a 200-year-old dialect or Middle English? different dialects. So because it can spread, it can vary. Obviously, it can vary in time as well. And perhaps those varieties in time can coalesce and form standards at different times. Um, dialect and language are not scientific terms. They are useful. Language, normally it's, it's to do with uh, language are not mutually understandable, but some languages are. You can talk um, Danish and Swedish people could kind of understand each other and dialects they can be very strong dialects that an English speaker might or a standard English speaker might have difficulty understanding 
but they'd still regard as all speaking English. So we could say that are non-standard varieties of a language. A lot of it is to do with territory, a state might have an official language. There's a lot of complicating factors, but they are useful, dialect and language. So what goes into a dialect? Um, here are the three broad things, and they tie in with linguistic fields of inquiry. So the accent, phonetics are just the sounds you can make. Phonology, how you organize the sounds into words. Uh, grammar, morphology and syntax, uh, words changing and word order, basically. And then lexicon, which is all the different words you might have, which are used in certain dialects and not in others. And pragmatics uh, could bring in how language is used, tone of voice, context, uh, situations. Um, so words can be used in different ways with different people. It becomes quite flexible um, as you look at it. So the first thing you might say, accent, how would we measure an accent? So traditionally, received pronunciation might be around London with the BBC, uh, maybe the Queen. Um, it's kind of a traditional style accent. A lot of it is to do with who is on the TV station or the radio, or oh, there's more regional dialect accents now, and similarly general American. So if you wanted to look at a dialect, you might give them this lexical set and ask the person to say these words, kit, dress, trap, lot, etc. You'd note down how the sounds are, and then you would say, okay, uh, some people would say lot and cloth, other people would say lot and cloth. So you've got different choices there. You also have, say, letter, do they pronounce that R at the end of letter? letter or letter, um, square or square. So an Irish person would pronounce the R, etc. cetera. Uh, you can also then have a chart like this. This is the um, vowel chart. And you can, the phonetician can then draw and say, well, they've raised the, the sound of the vowel of the O to sound more like a U, or they've rounded their lips more. Um, and so once you've got that, you can then say, okay, this is the accent. This is what they've done with their A's. This is what they've done with their U's, etc. And you can say, when you hear somebody talk like that, you can say, okay, you're from probably from the north of England because your vowels are like that. So how do we demarcate it? Now, the main thing is this is only kind of vague and fuzzy because people all talk slightly differently anyway. But let's talk about eyes and glasses, which are lines. So if here's a thing, this goes back to, well, 1960s, um, and there's a lot more mobility now. But anyway, the principle, US English is quite one language. People from the East and West Coast can still understand each other. TV and things like that even things out. So whether we call it a dialect or not, that depends what you want to say. Do you want to say the South Boston dialect, or do you want to say the East United States dialect? That depends how finely you're going to do it. Um, but Pei says, if you give somebody 24 words, you could place them within 30 kilometers of their home locality, which is tiny when you think how big the United States is, are. Um, so the words place the speaker East or West, North or South of a line until they're narrowed down to an area. So you've got Mary, 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 Wash. Um, uh, greasy or greasy, father or father, all this kind of thing. Um, and once you've got that, that's only 24 words, you could narrow it down to a certain area. Oops. Okay. Um, this has been done here. This is from Upton, a book about English. It's on the reading list. So thunder or thunder. That's got a simpler Isaac class there. You can see north, south. And you've got calf or calf. Is it like a v or a f? And you can see little islands there and things. So, so they've gone out to all these villages and towns and measured how people pronounce it. And that's your Isaac class. And if the Isaac glasses coincide, these don't really appear to. But if you have enough, you can then say people in the south of England do enough things in common to call it a dialect an accent part of a dialect. Uh, grammar can be done as well. So that's a, this is the second part. So this is a town called Reading, which is near London. And main and auxiliary words. So you've got, um, I do the washing up. I do like coffee. Do the washing up is the main verb, is doing something or going shopping. 
I'm going to do something is more auxiliary you're, you're using as a future. So these words, like I have been, or I have a cup of coffee in my hand, am I using as a main verb or auxiliary? And these, you can see there are the rules. Now you've got, I goes shopping, you do's that every day. We wants it, you has, they do's. So this is not what you'd find in standard, but in the auxiliary verbs, they're using it differently. They're using, I don't like standard, you have seen it. And they do have um, this, she don't instead of she doesn't. But that is a distinction that hasn't, that isn't made in the standard. In the standard, it would always be, I don't like it, or I don't do the washing up, or I, um, I haven't done something. So basically, this is a distinction that is, has been amalgamated in the standard language. Other dialects show double negation. So if you heard someone say, I ain't seen nobody, you might say, well, why have you got two negatives there? Uh, is this some sort of downturn in English? Well, you could go back to old English and say, well, there's a double negative there. And not gave you, me, never, a kid. The old word kid for a young goat. So, and ne si aldes thou, me nafre, you never, you not never gave me. So therefore, this is very old. Um, maybe the dialect preserved some old English uh, thing while standard English dropped it. Additional modality. He does be buying and selling old cars in Irish English. And that comes from contact with the Irish language. So Irish language has its own grammar. People who were bilingual started using English words, but they still had Irish grammar in their minds, which influenced. Okay, um, let's see. Let's have a quick um, look at this and probably you'll get it straight away. But which one is standard and non-standard? So she doesn't say anything. Is that standard or non-standard? Standard. Yeah. Standard, yeah. And two? Non-standard. Yeah, she don't Non standard. Say that. That's the double negation there. Yeah. He's not going anywhere. Yeah. Standard. Standard. Good. He ain't going nowhere. Non standard. Non -standard. Yes. Standard. I'm, I'm usually at work at nine. Standard. 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 I do be at work at nine. Non standard. Yeah. Non standard, of course. Good. Uh, so you, you'll get it straight away. Now you'll start then thinking, well, why is it? the non-stand and then now you know you'll be able to say it's got double negation what's this do yeah, be yeah. Well, a way of talking about a regular uh, thing here is one with a bit of pronunciation uh, going on we was talking about this and that non-standard non yes now that is kind mm -hmm. of i dialect you're writing down a pronunciation but it's also got we was instead of we were we were talking about this and that this one would be standard That's or standard yeah yeah mary be happy Non-standard. Non non like that, yeah. I mean, I could have it as an imperative, Mary, be happy or something, but yeah, here it isn't. Mary is It depends on happy. the intonation. It depends on the big, yes, very, very good. It depends on intonation. Excellent. Yeah, if we said, for example, Mary, be happy, so yeah. it's a kind of imperative, so yeah, it would be exactly. standard. Yeah. But the way but, you say it, it's not imperative, so it's not standard. Correct, exactly. And Mary be happy, it probably means the same as 10. Mary is always happy. She's generally happy. Yeah. Um, that's one Which way people. Standard. Yeah. Uh, last one. I've just told you. Standard. Very good. I'm after telling you. Non standard. Non standard. Do you know where I'm after telling you would come from? No, actually. No. <laughs> It's Irish English again, and that's the reason is in, in Irish language, oh, yeah. you have a construction <laughs> like that. So if you hear someone say, I'm after saying that, or I'm after doing that, you'd probably think they're Irish. Mm -hmm. So that's grand. Uh, Non-standard though, but enough people say it that it's a dialectical feature. Um, here are some other things. That, now the last bit is, well, not the last bit, but the last of the three things is words, the lexicon. So dialectical words are used in some areas. So hames, I made a right hames, I made a mess. That apparently comes from Dutch. It came into English language and it's used very heavily in Irish English. Uh, can, to know, is used in Scotland. It's related to cunning, canning. Uh, yeah. Somebody knows how to do things. That's very, very common. If you hear someone say that, I don't can. I can I'm not gonna try the accent because I can't do it. It means I don't know. Um, and also, that, so these are words, but also words can be used differently. So a related issue is semantic, the same form. If I said bold, 
What would you use bold for? Courageous. Yes, yeah. that's the standard English. The yeah. Irish English person, it would mean misbehaving, like a bold kid or something that didn't do their homework oh, wow. or something like that. Yeah. Oh, okay. And apparently that's the older meaning. So sometimes dialects preserve old meanings while standard English moves ahead or, or changes, you know. Um, grand, what would you think grand would be? Big, big, huge. Yes, yes. In mm. Irish English, it means okay, I'm grand. Anyway. This is totally different. Yes. Unless you, you're mixed in the society, you'll never know how to get it. Well, the funny, if you have any, if you meet some Irish people and if they say I'm grand, now you know, they just mean, it means fine, it means okay, yeah. grand, not good, well, we're, kind of We're good. actually, yeah, we were in Ireland, in Dublin uh, in 2019, okay. and yeah, we were surprised by their use of the word grand, but we learned oh, it, yeah. <laughs> yes, very, very yeah. Yeah. this is a very yeah. common word there. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> well, anyway, none of this should confuse you about teaching English. This is standard English versus dialects, and they, they can coexist quite happily with each other. And it's good that you heard that people using it. You're probably yeah. Yeah, surprised at first. It's great. Um, great that you could then see it in use. Um, yeah. Dialectical words then are now, you had the standard forming, and all of these words were kind of washing around. They didn't get into the standard locality, so they stayed in a particular area as a dialect, but they're often used in stylistic. Somebody writing a poem has like a paint palette. They can choose some of these words and put them in to make something nice, prose or poetry. So that kind of expands the range of things we have. And you might see it if you read um, a book written by somebody in a dialect and get a, you know kind of special meanings from what they're writing. Uh, you can also do it with the lexicon. So would you say a pail or a bucket for something that you put water into? Okay. Bucket, yeah, I'd say bucket, but there is the word pale, which kind of is used in some nursery rhymes and things. And maybe it's older, but look, north of this line, mm -hmm. people said pale and south, they said bucket. Um, mm -hmm. Dragonfly is what? Yes, it's, um, it's a type it's a of plant. insect, yeah. Yeah, it's a beautiful insect, very colorful. Yeah. But apparently, mm -hmm. and I didn't know this, <laughs> north of it is mm -hmm. the darning needle. And the darning needle is actually for stitching clothes and things, but people north of this line call it that. And the last one, again, swingle tree, whipple tree, whipple tree, is a part of a piece of metal that holds a carriage onto a horse. So it could be quite a rural word, not a word I'd ever use, but swingle tree is what they'd say at south and whipple tree north. So look, they actually coincide. Yeah. To a large extent. These are three completely different words and yet the people north of it use one set and the people south generally use another set which is quite interesting. I don't know did they all come in at a certain time together. So you could then say if you, according to this you've got a dialectical feature and you can see it coincides a little bit in the far east of this map but there's other things largely the west, the midland, north central as we've seen, if you wanted to, you could narrow it down even further. These are just broad outlines. So it's up to you or a researcher deciding on dialect, how narrowly they want to focus a dialect. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, here are some words gathered from British English. Can you guess what they all mean? Or any of them, maybe. <laughs> well, What do you do with tea normally? Tea, we drink it. <laughs> yeah, but before you drink it, maybe, yeah. well, maybe you make it. We boil it, it, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> um, snow blossom, maybe something to do with snow. Uh, what can kind of blossom out snow of snow? Blossom. Is, uh, it a, is it an expression or just a word? Uh, this one uh, is a word. Is it an expression or something? Yeah, uh -huh. some of them are words and some of them are um, idioms. So idioms uh -huh. several words that all have to be understood together. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I kind of knew. Uh, it's a kind mm -hmm. of amphibian, uh, a newt, and it used to be called a oh. an ute, oh. and then the N got attached to mm -hmm. the E. Anyway, I'll show you the answers. 
So a snow blossom is okay. a <laughs> snowflake. Oh. Mm. Yeah. Somerset. That's in south of England. Time for a snack. Mm -hmm. uh, time for a snack. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yes, this the number two um, comes from miners, right? I when, possibly, yes. yes. When they want to eat two meals in one, meat and fruit ah. at the same time. Yeah. So they take a snack, they take it. Um, very good. They have to eat quickly. I think so. Okay. Very, very fast. Snap decision. Yeah. I see. That's excellent. Yeah. Sometimes when you look at these things, it all kind of starts falling into place. Um, masking the tea, infusing, putting in the you tea. You will find it. It has a reason behind it, which is oh, actually, okay. Yeah. Interesting. It has a reason behind it. it you might give it, a, give it to us as a homework if you wish. <laughs> yeah. It'd be funny, um, like if somebody used different mixes of these, like if you use some South of England ones and North of England ones, then you say, well, what dialect are you? So some of them are very much associated, but some of them are, sp are said in several places. Um, so the place was all fruited. You can see, obviously, the place was all something, a kind of adjective, so untidy or disordered. Uh, clinker bells, icicles. Now, do they knock against each other and make a tune? I mean, they look like they could. I don't know in practice, do they? Or maybe when the water melts, perhaps, but clinker bells. Sounds like things which are making a, a sound. A great mother, um, great there meaning big. I'm really stalled, fed up, weary, maybe stalled. I can't move or decide what to do or something like that. Um, a barren child is quite well known in well, Scotland and parts of the north. Mm -hmm. uh, an effet, newt. And fill up your piggy, it's time for bed. Why is a piggy a hot water bottle? I'm not sure, but anyway, there you go. Uh, so these are words that are mm -hmm. dialectical mm -hmm. features. Sometimes you can guess by context. If you read it in a novel or something, you might be able to tell. Um, this is a very important dictionary and grammar, but is around the turn of the 20th century. So he, when he wrote, he knew that the, the dialects were disappearing, possibly because of train lines, people moving to cities, dialects mixing and flattening. The classic way a dialect would survive would be if people are not traveling far, far to mix with other dialects. So they have time to become localized and stable. So preserved over um, some of the dialect forms, preserved aspects of older English. So you can imagine in a city, lots of different dialect speakers are mixing and developing new forms and the old dialects would preserve and be, and be more stable. Uh, excuse me? Yeah. Uh, is this dictionary available uh, online? Uh, Joseph Fried's English uh, dialect dictionary? Can I you... actually don't know. Some of these things, if they're that old, they could be out of copyright. It'd be nice to think it was on, um, I, I don't know in short. Um, do you I'll, have this? I'll check it out. Some of these things are on Gutenberg and things, you know, but um, yeah, it would be very interesting to read. If you can, if you have it, could you please um, send us uh, the link to this dictionary? Yeah, I'll, I'll look into that and find it. Yeah. Thank you very much. No problem. Um, okay, so this is what we talked about was kind of more linguistic -y type of thing where you're measuring vowels and you're looking at grammar and you're asking people things. But perceptual dialectology is what people perceive themselves to be the dialects. And they could pick up things that the linguist mightn't have picked up because they would hear other people speaking and know the particular features of the dialect, you know, 20 kilometers away or whatever, what's different. So here's a map of Britain and Ireland and broad brush and lots of finer um, differences as well. So the differences could, could also be um, stereotyped and you might say um, an Irish accent with a very strong R or something like that. And then you say, well, not everybody does, but it's the classic Irish accent. So let's have a look at some examples. You might've heard of this play, have you? Or of course, you? <laughs> I studied it. Yes, yeah, of okay. course, <laughs> I studied that. Yeah. Okay, and there's a movie about it as well called My Fair Lady. My Fair Lady. 
Yeah. Yeah. So she was. It has uh, been adapted and huh? a play as well. It's a, a play. play. Well, originally, yeah, this was, was a play in 1913. Now, his point was um, well, he said, it's impossible for an Englishman to open his mouth without making another Englishman hate or despise him, which is not. Um, not great, but was that true? 1913, it could have been, you know, class bound or whatever. So you had the woman from a part of London and he thought by changing the accent, he thought his ear was so attuned, he could tell what street, within two streets where the person was by a selection of vowels. And, and so he went out into the street. At first he was called the note taker. It didn't, uh, Henry Higgins, the professor of phonetics, but he'd go out and listen to people. Yeah. Um, so you get the idea. How, how do you perceive it? How was he able to tell it? How would anybody else be able to tell or place? What are you listening out for? So anyway, let's have a look then. How do you do that? Here is a map. You give somebody a blank map. Now there's nothing there about dialects. You just give them a pencil and you say, can you draw what you think the dialects are? And that's the popular perception. And then you add all the maps together and you say, if enough people say, that the Irish accent is this, then perhaps there's some truth in the Irish accent that Irish speakers mightn't be aware of because we're, you know, we hear it every day. So then they might be asked how you feel towards particular accents. So this is a, a rough thing by adding together many different um, maps. Geordie um, around Newcastle, Scouse around Liverpool, Mm -hmm. Yeah, descriptive by going out and, and listening rather than putting any preconceptions. It's just descriptive. Very good. Uh, York, a large county, Yorkshire. The Midlands, uh, Eastern. The Southern is quite large and it's surprising to see it's like that because you'd have a very strong London one and then maybe some other dialects and then the Western. And it only has England. There's also Welsh, Scottish and within this context, Irish as well. So there's just some notes here about what people might think. They might not have heard somebody. So if you didn't spend much time in Western England, you mightn't be able to hear all the subdivisions of the Western English accent. So if you spend time there, you'd be able to say, okay, that's a Cornwall accent, that's a Devon accent. So a lot of it is to do with face-to-face -face exposure to dialect variation. Your ear gets attuned to it. So let's have a case example, there's Manchester north west of England. Mm -hmm. um, so they were asked to draw borders on the city, not the whole country, just the city. So this is really, really detailed and asked to provide words um, to describe mm -hmm. the accents and dialects. And this is a quote from uh, Rob Drummond, a, a lecturer in linguistics. And he said there's five clear dialect areas. So quite a lot within one city with words characterizing each. So people were asked what they thought about these areas, perception. Uh, it's the co collective impression of people who live in Manchester and not language experts who might not know, like if they grew up somewhere else, they mightn't hear all the different differences in, in accent. So an accent map of Manchester is like this. So you've got the broad color and within that, so some of them are country, maybe they're on the, on the the border of the countryside. Some of them sound posh, um, soft. Uh, so all of this, and it, there's no way of, of predicting any of this, but if that's what people think, then you wonder like, what are they picking up on? And in the center, metropolitan, diverse, artsy, non-descriptive, maybe things get flattened in the center of cities where lots of people are kind of coming and going uh, and then more traditional areas around there. So this is what the people of Manchester thought in an accent map. And that would be perceptual dialectology, which is what people perceive rather, rather than there's any objective uh, thing to it, which is interesting in itself. Mm -hmm. uh, here's an example from Northern Ireland. So there's a word scundered. I found this in some letters that were in the paper. And uh, these journalists were talking about Northern Irish and particular things about Northern Irish. And the first guy says scundered. And he explains what it means. It doesn't mean embarrassed. It means fed up or disgusted. So he says, you know, we should understand what that means. And the next guy uh, writes that, okay, scundered, yes. Ulster Scots is a kind of dialect spoken in the North. 
and related, as it says, to Scots. But this guy is saying you can actually, not just the word, but how it's pronounced. So scundered and scunnered, uh, mm -hmm. the difference between the posh part on the southern area of Belfast Lock and the more what, common Carrick Fergus on the northern side and those of us emanating. So he, because he lived there, was able to tell the difference between two pronunciations of scundered or scunnered, which somebody outside would just write it down as scundered. So it shows how you can finally divide and finally study, or you can take a broader brush, depending on, on your focus of study. Um, in Dublin, um, ah, very good, yeah, <laughs> I was wondering. <laughs> Um, did I pronounce it right? Sc scunnered. Very good. Okay. Yeah, scunnered. Well done. Excellent. Um, well, yeah, then, then to Dublin. And in Dublin, the D4 accent, the, it's sometimes called the Dort because there's a train line called the Dart. And it was perceived wealthy, fashionable area. But this uh, book, Ross O'Carroll Kelly, is a rugby player from this area, you know, fictional, obviously. But it's written as core pork instead of car park, loik instead of like, and reich. He's, he's softening the T. And his whole newspaper column and books are all written in this dialect. So this is what the author actually isn't from D Force, but he is, he's writing in a stereotypical way from what everybody recognizes, even though you can't quite put your finger on it. And one of the quotes from a professor in UCD was um, that they wanted to make it broader than just Irish culture and make it more sort of, well, you have mid-Atlantic accents, more American, more English. Mm. Um, so it's been, and the very people satirized now have embraced this and it, it's become quite a phenomenon in uh, Ireland. That's a D4. Sometimes people write like that one was written in the I dialect, which is written as it's pronounced. So you can kind of imagine how the person's speaking. Mm. And the last one was from Dublin Southside. Dublin Northside is another um, set of books by Roddy Doyle and some movies. A lot of it is just written in spoken. There's not so much narrative, it's just people talking. And here is what we have here. So am I hua? They're not pronouncing the T. It's not hua, it's hua in a group. Doing hua, singing, me singing. So it's all to do with acting. There's no real grammatical differences shown there, but it is doing the accent that then would be recognized as a Dublin uh, accent, another Dublin accent as well. And then to the other side of the world, um, Australia. Now, I have uh, a guy who grew up in Sydney, and he told me that basically somebody from Perth, somebody from Sydney, there's no particular strong difference in accent. Um, I don't know why, maybe it's, it's uh, English, England hasn't had enough time to develop all the different accents there. Maybe people move more. Uh, but the Australian accent itself, sometimes called strine, which is like saying Australian really fast in an Australian accent, in a strine accent, and up talk. So everything's like this, kind of in a question. Did you meet anyone from Australia? Uh, no, but um, I myself watched uh, a lot of uh, movies that include people from Australia and there, and I'm familiar with the accent somehow, but I okay. haven't met uh, someone and yeah. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, one of the, we call it up talk, and sometimes some younger people in Ireland and England have up talk, like talking in Australian accents. Some of them might have spent time there, and others would have watched um, Australian soap operas. And also ending sentences of A, so not bad A, like that. So yeah. there are some very distinctive things about Australian. But within us, the, the accents are less apparently than um, within Ireland and England. Mm -hmm. uh, and just I put in pragmatic variation, which um, northerners in the United States get to the point and are more direct, and southerners engage in small talk first. Uh, how are you? maybe nice weather, et cetera. So not just pronunciation, grammar, meaning of words, but also style of speaking. It can lead to misunderstandings. If somebody is like rude, you're getting to the point too fast or hesitant, why don't you come out and say it or whatever? Okay. 
So if you think of dialects, and we try to draw eyes or glasses, or people try to draw eyes or glasses, um, you could also think of it as a continuum, which would mean that every um, idiomatic expressions, exactly what people would, would talk about and um, tone of voice and context of idioms, is it meant to be taken literally or is it meant to be used in other things? All of that would be within pragmatics as well. You can think of a dialect continuum uh, as a term for a chain of varieties. If you think of England, this long, thin island, people speaking English and other languages, but let's uh, just English, going all the way down and each group within 10 miles can obviously can understand the people next to them. But as the distance increases, the people from the far ends can't, and that's called a continuum. And then you say, well, where does the dialect end or begin? So A understands B, B and C, but A and C can't understand each other. Very common in dialectology. And there was a controversy here, uh, a story in the BBC, that some North Sea fishermen from Scotland, speaking English, but perceived by people in the South to have very strong accents. So they were subtitled. And some Scots were saying, well, why did you need to subtitle it? Because it's English. And so there, there's a conversation about that. Um, do the people in London maybe didn't understand, or maybe vice versa, maybe people in Scotland could understand people in London, which is called asymmetry, from um, watching TV or listening to um, politicians in London. Sometimes you get that, that it's asymmetrical. Anyway, so it's, it's quite, it's practical as well. Subtitles obviously are normally used if people are speaking different languages. You wouldn't think it if people are speaking different dialects of the same language. Um, we'll take a break in five minutes. Uh, we'll just go um, to look at um, diglossia. So diglossia means two languages, but you might say if somebody has a dialect and a standard, how do they coexist? And one of the things is high and low dialects, although we, we often now just say H and L, just to say that L is no lower really than H. So the low dialect is what you learn. Kids learn the language without anyone teaching them. They just hear it around them from their family and friends. And that's the first one you speak as you're learning language. Later on, when you go to school, you learn this H, which is your sort of serious formal standard language. Um, you know. uh, diglossia is where they exist side by side. So the same person would speak L sometimes and sometimes H. But the L dialect is not disparaged. Nobody says it's, it's, uh, it shouldn't be spoken. It it's, can survive for centuries. It's, it's perfectly um, accepted. So here are some situations. This is Ferguson's original paper. In a sermon, you expect to hear you know, maybe quite serious language. It's quite old fashioned, 1959, instructions to servants, waiters, etc. but anyway, informal. Personal letter, maybe people now would write in the low dialect. Speech in Parliament, political speeches, very highfalutin kind of serious language, unless in different contexts, maybe when they're going for votes and things, it'd be different. University lecture, perhaps H. Conversation with family and friends, yeah, definitely L. And if you spoke H with your family and friends, they might think it sounded a bit weird and artificial. News broadcasts, soap opera, um, captions, editorials, poetry, could be written in a very sort of serious formal language. Maybe people now write in the L and folk literature as people told stories. We'll just go through this um, different characteristics sort of function, different things. Function uh, H is the formal, L is informal. Sometimes people think H is superior. The big um, written literature in H. Acquisition, as I was saying, uh, adults use L when they're speaking to kids and then you learn H later standardization, grammatical study. Um, people have been studying it and working out all the rules. Maybe the L has got less study on the rules. People just have a feel for it. Um, stability, the two can exist for centuries together. Uh, H may, might have more grammatical categories, um, more rules, maybe H, well, it's a small one in England, um, maybe whom would be an H and then in L people don't say whom. Uh, bulk of vocabulary is, is shared. So basically they are recognized as the same language, but just different dialects or registers or styles and maybe sound as well. There could be more sounds in H. So a person might speak their regional English dialect with their friends and family. 
and learn standard English in school they would use for formal situations, applying for a job, etc. Not everybody has diglossia. If you speak the standard language at home, um, you, then you don't have diglossia. But this just shows that somebody can have, can speak their dialect and have standard English. It's not mutually exclusive. Okay, let's fly through these. Um, do you think these are H or L? So religion, H or L? Yes, L is like informal language. H. Yeah. H. 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 Yeah. Literature? It's H. 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 Uh, both. I, I believe both uh, high and low in uh, lit literature. Okay. I mean, you can now, like some of those ones I showed earlier, you could argue are L. Uh, they become literature. Like literature, sometimes people think is something from, you know, old and canonical, but it, it develops over time. So, and also sometimes L becomes the new H, but the theory behind it, newspapers, editorial rather. H. Yeah, broadcasting, TV news. H. No. Um, oh, TV, okay. I'm sorry, TV news is the uh, H. Yeah, it's, it's H actually. And one reason might be that they want the TV news, everybody in the country to see it. So therefore H is like a, a common language everyone speaks. And in local TV stations or radio stations, they could have the L if only people who speak that dialect are going to be listening. Um, education, written material, lectures. H. Education, H. lesson, discussion. H. Uh, L. So yeah. No, lesson discussion. The discussion like we're having now could, could tend more to be L because yeah. you, know, you want to speak and, and chat about things where yeah. it's elected themselves and more sort of serious language. Uh, shopping. L, definitely. L. Yeah. Uh, gossiping. L. Definitely L. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because it's, yeah, but by its nature, it'll be with people, you know, friends or people you know. Friends. Yeah. Yes. Applying for a job. A H. Yeah, going to a restaurant. L. 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 Yeah, and linguistic landscape. That's when you go out into the street and you see things written down. It's H as well. H. H. Well, H. yes. Yeah, probably H. Now, that would be for big kind of more things which last a long time. You might get L in a cafe or restaurant or um, local shop, you might something that's coming up like a sale that day, something that doesn't last for, for so long. But if it's, it's, if it's a fixture screwed into the wall, like a sign or something, it's probably more likely to be H, yeah. Okay, um, it's five, two, two in Ireland. Um, will we take a break now? Hey, can I ask a question? Sure, yeah. Uh, is there a difference between uh, dialect uh, variety and variation, or uh, are they used uh, interchangeably? Uh, well, variety is kind of broader. A variety could be any kind of different speech. You could even have varieties of um, gender and age, young people's speech, older people's speech, men and women. But dialect tries to put an overall pattern onto the variety. So I would say a dialect is a higher look at all these varieties because the varieties are all over, like different mixes, complications. And the dialect tries to say, okay, let's organize these varieties into a dialect. And it's just a step before language. So variety is the underlying thing and dialect is on top of that as a rule. Okay, thank you. Yeah, good question. Thank you. Um, okay, so how long will we take? Will we take um, half an hour? 20 minutes? Okay. Yeah, okay, half an hour. We'll come back then at um, 25 past, and we'll go through the second half. If you have any questions, just ask me, and we'll go through that. Okay, see you soon. Hello, and uh, welcome back. I uh, hope you had a good break. Is is everyone there? Yes, I'm here. Hello. Excellent. Okay. Let us go on to part two. So as you see in this slide, which has been there for <laughs> half an hour, uh, pluricentrism mm -hmm. is multiple centers. So more than one accepted standard. Which one is the standard? Well, there's several. So standardization mm -hmm. came from 
one standard language emerging from dialects, usually enabled by a center of power, a government. Uh, that means if you have different countries, different selection of dialects, and they select a different standard. Now, people can stay in touch and standards can converge, or they may diverge. And they may differ, yeah, greater or lesser extent. So there's the definition. Several interacting centers, each providing a national variety with at least some of its own norms. So the first thing that might occur to you in this context is American and British English. Yeah. So endonormative yeah. means from within. So within the country, several dialects coexist. And the English speakers went to America in the 1600s, 1700s. So it, there was a potential for it to diverge, but then technology has kind of brought us back together. But there are some differences. Um, one of them becomes the standard and therefore history, center of power, London, uh, big cities in America, etc. Then media and international relations. When that country starts sending out ambassadors and talking to other countries, it's got a standard language and maybe they learn each other's languages, etc. So that's just re-saying. But that pluricentricity, if you want to kind of give the theory behind it, it would have to be when America became independent because before that, if it's a colony, if it was ruled from London, it's, you know, it's, it's British English, but then suddenly you've got American English and it's got its own standard. And there's now increasing number of other varieties. So the UK would have traditional substratum is national. English speakers were there anyway, and then it became a, and it came from the Germanic language and then it became standard English. Immigrant, if enough people, English speakers go to a country, then that becomes mm. the English speakers in this country. So that's like 200 years ago, English speakers to Australia. And then the other, the third type is nativized colonial varieties. Not that many English speakers went to India, but they were the people who were in charge or running the government and things. So there wasn't a kind of a substratum of people uh, talking, you know, English dialects or whatever. It was more of kind of H style formal things. So the slightly different ideas between, and all of these countries now have got standardized English, but it, they arrived at it in different ways, you could say. Uh, some people now talk about this. You might have seen this in other contexts, but um, the circle model. So the inner circle would be the traditional America, Britain, Australia, New Zealand. The outer circle would be, well, India, we mentioned Bangladesh, Kenya, the kind of colonial ones where English was spoken, uh, you know, quite heavily, um, starting out by, by government people, but also by other people who interacted. So you have people who would grow up speaking English. And the expanding circle, um, Egypt would be included, China, Japan, Korea, where a lot of people are learning English. And so English is kind of growing outwards. Have you seen that in other contexts, the, the circle model? In, in kind of talking about world Englishes? No, I, uh, yes, I know, uh, I personally know world Englishes, but I've never seen this uh, model. Before. Yeah, I mean it's just one kind yes, of scheme. Yes, I have, I have seen this actually. I've seen this, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things is norm providing. So people traditionally would look to America or Britain. What's the norms? What is you know English? But that mightn't be true as as this changes. So norm developing Bangladesh, Kenya, Pakistan will have their own Englishes, which then become bona fide standards there. They don't have to look to America or Britain. And that could happen in the expanding circle in time if people want and if enough people speak English, other standards could expand. So that's why it's expanding as it grows out. But then other languages might also come in. So this is kind of one way of looking at world Englishes, all starting from dialects, standardizations, variation, and differing from each other to Can a great- Can I ask a question yeah. here if sure. you don't mind? Yeah. Yeah, I guess that uh, here, um, the outer circle here uh, stands for the um, the English as a standard language or as an official language in these countries, uh, maybe uh, in addition to their original languages, while the external uh, um, uh, circle here uh, that the English is a second language, it's not the standard language for these countries. Um, yes, do exactly. I the, the very outer right one. Or, uh, that, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, most people there would have their own, the, the standard language of that country. 
but it's a lot of people there are learning English. So maybe they will join the outer circle. Like if you go on to, I'll have another slide later, the Microsoft uh, computer, um, and you put in British English, American English, Irish English, and, and lots of other countries. And one day you could have um, Korean English or Israeli English, perhaps, maybe not yet. And when that happens, then that will have joined the outer circle and you'd have a standard of English from that country. Now, whether that's wanted or not, it, it could just be, but the people in the outer expanding circle, would they, when you're learning English, are you still looking towards American or British English? Like what standard do you learn when you're teaching or learning English? Do you look to Britain or America or for a standard? Uh, in in Egypt, we yeah. uh, we look for both actually. <laughs> for uh, uh, we we must refer to either American English or British English, and we use okay. the uh, CEFR uh, yeah. in uh, devising the tests and so on. So yeah, we still of course refer to them when yeah. we're teaching English and learning. So. Like a lot of people in in Europe would look to British English, and then people in China might look to American English, just depending which of the centers is, is closer and, and, you know, historical reasons. And then, you know, you, it, the small things like spelling, do you spell color with an O or O-U-R? Um, but we look at that, but that's, that's what, where is one drawing the, um, the so-called norm from? And that could change with world Englishers. It ends up being decentralized with lots of different ones. Does that answer that's your exactly, question? Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you're probably familiar with these. Um, I think they're quite small. This is for the standards. Like if you really wanted to find big divergences, you'd have to look at dialects, which we looked at before the break. But the standards, yeah, there are some words like faucet and fall. Perhaps they were from 200 years ago in America. Um, tap, autumn. Have you seen these? Um, spelling is definitely course, yeah. codified. So Webster, Noah Webster, set up the American Dictionary of the English Language and thought color and center were more logical, whereas mm. color and center in the British one uh, were probably from French and, and other ways. And then a ever afterwards, that becomes the standard set up and you know, people learn that. Uh, punctuation, there's some, some small things there like um, a serial comma, pears, comma, and grapes. That ends up being style guides. Um, you've got Chicago style, APA style, British styles. Um, if you're writing mm -hmm. a journal article, you check with them what the style is and go with that. So they're not huge between the standards, I think. Here's some other differences. The band is playing, the band are playing. Hmm. What would you say? Uh, it's lots of people, but it's just one band. Um, the British say, I have got, hmm. I have got home. The Americans, I have gotten home, which is older. So America kept some older version and needn't. A British hmm. English person would say that and an American would say, don't need to. Mm. Um, this is kind of verging into what people, how people use it rather than some sort of prescriptive, you have to say this or you have to say that. But um, mm -hmm. Irish English, the standard is very similar to British English. We spell things just like British English. There are some spoken language thing which is now coming away from a center, but we say, I've no money at all at all, which comes from the Irish, er, bich, er, something else. Uh, I have my bike fixed different word order. I put something here as well, which I, um, yes or dinner. So you got you and then use as the plural, and then you're forming a genitive from it, yes or. So that, that would be done in Irish English. Mm -hmm. Uh, but only can, I, can I comment yeah. on something? I'm sorry. Yeah. sorry to interrupt you, but uh, in the uh, calc from the Irish language, I have my bike fixed. I think this is used to, to mean that someone has fixed it for me. So you, you mean the Irish use it to say that they have fixed their own bike, but the word order is just different? Yeah, uh, no, I, I would look at it as I, I have a fixed bike. I have my bike fixed. I wouldn't look at it as putting the object before the verb. But um, mm -hmm. so I, I, whenever I see that, I, I have my bike fixed. I have it done. Um, you have this, you know, that kind of thing. But you're right. Mm -hmm. It's, it's um, I think that would be. It's common in English, yeah. Mm -hmm. They didn't get someone else. They could have done it themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, it certainly, yeah, if you say I had my bike fixed, that could be the thing. I had something done. I had my car fixed, or whatever. Um, uh -huh. Like okay. you have the end result of the bike. Good. Good question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, can sure, I ask okay. a question, please? Sure. 
Uh, could you please move to the slide uh, in which you uh, write uh, punctuation? Yeah. Uh, yes, I, I can't understand your point on punctuation. Um, you write, I bought apples, pears, and grapes. Would so you? How, Yanni, uh, how uh, do you write this sentence in British English? I can't understand your point. You could leave out the comma after pears, apples, pears, and grapes, and not have uh. a comma. In British English? Yes. Now, curiously, this is also called the Oxford comma. So th there is a kind of a style element to this. This isn't, um, it's like a oh, convention okay. that is more common, but you could say apples, pears, and grapes. And sometimes it's useful in distinctions if you have what, what you're grouping with what. But this is just more the serial comma is the standard in America. That's what people would do. And so in, in British English, you, uh, you leave out the comma? Yeah. In, in the last comma. The last comma only. So you have apples, comma, pears, and grapes. Oh, uh, okay. Other one. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Good question. Uh, in Indian English, I just found some very small differences. There was a, a novel written in Indian English, which I found somebody said, I got up and wore my trousers. Now, in British English, you're wearing them all day. In Indian English, you're putting them on for the first time. And also the older word, thrice. Twice, thrice, three times, which is kind of gone in standard British English. You, you would understand it, but it's old fashioned, very, very common still in India. But apart from that, um, the standard language, very similar. So the big divergence um, seems to be US British with spelling. So all of these would be some spelling things, but presumably also speech recognition. Um, many, many countries, a lot from the former Commonwealth, um, historical English speakers. So uh, let's ask quickly, uh, do you walk on the pavement or the sidewalk? Sometimes we use them interchangeably, you know. Okay. Do you ever say footpath? No, never footpath. I've, this yeah. is the first time we've heard this okay. word. Yeah. I say footpath. Footpath is, is more Irish English. But uh, pavement. Really? Okay. Yeah. I'm gonna learn it now. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, do you fill your car with gas or petrol? Gas. No. Yes. Okay. That's more American. Eh? Uh, when you've made a mistake, do you use a rubber or an eraser? Rubber. Okay. Uh, both here. I For me, both. I I say eraser. Okay. But to rubber is uh, I use it too. Yeah. Um. For you, are chips hot or cold? Chips. Chips yeah. <laughs> hot, of course. For me, they're hot, but for an American person, they could be yeah. cold that you get in the supermarket in a packet. I would say crisps for that. They might say fries. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, lift or elevator? I think elevator is more common, but, but both are used. Yeah, and then tin or can opener. Can. Yeah. Can. Can. Okay, I think can was American. It's becoming British now as well. Uh, do you queue up or line up? Line up. Okay. Uh, line up and queue up. I mean, both are familiar as well. Yes, but yeah, sometimes we use them interchangeably as well. Good. So that's that's what yeah. I got from that. That they are interchangeable. Um, some of them you'd use one more than the other, but there, there seems to be a lot of interchangeability, which is fine. That's um, so some of them are more related to or associated with one or the other. Uh, city center or center, these are spelling, so they're, they're very straight. Um, on balance, would you use the American or the British there, spelling? Actually, the American uh, spelling is a little bit easier. It goes with how you pronounce the word, so yeah, so, yeah I use it. And I guess you're but when I teach, yeah. teach. Yeah, which one do you teach? I teach both. I mean, I tell, I make my students aware of the difference between the two. Yeah, very good. Um, I guess, as you know, like the main thing is to be kind of consistent and, and keep. And your, the computer normally then corrects whatever you've set it to Britain or America, if, if you didn't catch all of them. But um, yes. yeah. 
Yeah. Anyway, there we go. We, we recognize them. Program has become for computers, uh, the American style without the M-E, even in Britain. There's other words like billion as well, which we now use the American billion. So mm. people yeah. used to say Americanisms, but here's some Australian ones. Do you say, which of those do you think is Australian? Lollies, candy or sweets? And yes. I think lollies. lollies yeah, lollies. I guess. Lollies is, is Australian. Australian, yeah. Candy yeah. is American. Sweets is, is mm -hmm. British. Australians yeah. replace sweets for dessert. Uh, Manchester, they say Manchester with a capital M, like mm. the for bed linen. Mm. And they say chuck for chicken. Yeah, I've never heard. That. And paddock for field. Paddock is like an old fashioned word for field, but. Australians would use that in mm. Australian English. Again, the, the, these are only small kind of word differences, but it's not huge um, grammatical differences. How do they develop in the first place? So we've talked a lot about dialects, and the real thing is it's considered inevitable. It always changes. Uh, the child listens to the people around it and draws up a grammar. But depending who they hear, whatever circumstance, they might be a tiny bit different from somebody else. And those are the rules. And then they would say, this is my rules, my intuition with the language. And if it's different and enough people pick it up, and if people are living separately from each other, over generations, the differences multiply and accumulate. And then you get a dialect. And the dialect could spread across in a continuum, starting in one area and spreading across. Now, a lot of times now, because people travel around more, that can even things out. But for historical reasons, there's still quite a lot of dialecty um, things and it, it won't stop language will always change we think so we we looked at over um, space and social groups so naturally now we can look over time as well and it'll also show us the origin of dialects so the Saussure looked at synchronic which is when you're just looking at linguistics as it is and also time as another dimension. So you could grab any time you liked, usually today, but you could say, what was language like in 1800 and take a snapshot. And you're pretending that time doesn't exist when you do that. You're thinking the language was in this state, but actually the language was a big collection of dialects at any stage. So which of those dialects, which selection will you use when you're saying, what is the language? Standardization has helped you with your choice, but stretching back with all those dialects, you'd have to say, what, was, what do people speak like in Ireland 400 years ago, etc. So all languages change, writing slows it down. This is why you can't speak, well, Old English without special training. Middle English probably can, but it's, it's more difficult as well. There's always changes going on. So I'll very briefly go through this. Old English was Germanic, German speakers went across, um, old German speakers. And that was probably the H dialect because the ones who wrote were the people who knew how to write. And so they wrote these kind of formal texts and the people who spoke L dialects wouldn't have written it down. So when you're reading old English, you think it's, it's that kind of style. Middle English had more people writing and more um, dialects written down and people spelt them in all sorts of ways because there wasn't the standardization yet. So we can use that to say how people the accent, because the way they wrote it, we can kind of guess then they probably meant uh, it's pronounced this way. And then there were some changes into modern English. Shakespeare, you can probably read because it's early modern already. Uh, there was a big vowel change um, and increasing standardization because of printing presses. This was the big difference in pronunciations. And some of them, if a dialect did not go through this, people would have a different accent. So bite used to be pronounced beat, and that's bite. And bout used to be pronounced boot, and boot used to be pronounced bought. So all of these words change. But as I was saying, if there was a, a dialect that didn't go through this process, and that's the kind of thing that happens, the standard language changes or a lot of dialects change, and that, that becomes the new pronunciation, but the old pronunciation stays the same. So it's also uneven. So thou, you're probably familiar with thou, when there used to be a singular uh, yeah. second person. And English did a kind of ultra polite thing. We only use the plural you now all the time, like French does with vous. 
and but they still have two. So thou went, but some people still speak it in the north of England. So some dialects did not get rid of that distinction. So this is why dialect evolution is quite interesting because it explains how the dialects got there in the first place. Uh, semantic changes, words can change in meaning. So dog was one type of, dog cat was one type of dog, only one type, now it means all dogs. Meat used to mean food, now it only means food from animals. Girl used to mean a child of either sex in Middle English. Uh, so it's narrowed. And then semantic shift, bad, some young people say that's bad, meaning that's good. Does that mean in a hundred years that bad will become good, if you know what I mean? And then knave used to mean a servant. Now it means a dishonest person. So words can change meaning. So if you read an old text, you will see, uh, you might be thrown off and say, well, how come, what, what are they saying? And you say, well, that, that's what people used to talk like. Uh, what's, what's, what they used to mean by a word. So the process is ongoing. And all these variations could end up as a standard. One day they say, well, that's actually the accepted shared meaning. Kind of disconcerting as well, the words can be used in different contexts um, with certain meanings, but we normally get it from context. So have a look at this. Uh, Stiorfen used to mean to die. Now it means to die from lack of food. What do you think happened there? What's the term for that? That would be narrow. uh, narrowing, I think. Yeah. 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 Wicked. Have you ever heard someone say that's wicked? Yes. Young it's people mean, now. It's well, you, it's, it's, not, it's wicked. not common now. It's not common now. No, exactly. Some of these things uh, pass out. Some things stay in the language and some things become old very fast and that's not used anymore. Um, whatever, 20 years ago, maybe people, younger people might say that's wicked, meaning it's good, but it used to mean bad. Funny to think a word can mean two different opposites, just depending. And cool. Yeah, it's a semantic shift. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, it's, I think it's broadening with cool. Yes, so, it's broadening. But, yeah. Wicked would be semantic shift and cool would be broadening. Yes. It doesn't just yes. mean, it still means low temperature, but it also means great or very good. Yeah. 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 So that's the kind of changes. And then you might find a dialect still uses it in a certain way or use it. Mm -hmm. the same way. Uh, let's look through speech islands. So why would a dialect survive? It's normally, um, dialect continuum was what we looked at when we comparing and drawing eyes or glasses. But a dialect can stay separate from the surrounding people if they're self-sufficient, if they can grow their own food, they don't have to talk to other people that much. They'll always talk a little bit, but they can keep uh, a certain amount of traditions going. So let's briefly look at this. This has influenced how people talk today in the Southeast of Ireland and a little bit in Dublin. So Middle English came across in 1170. Those speakers became Irish speaking and English almost died out, but stayed in two places, Fingolian and Yola, Fingal and, and Forth and Bargy. So people there spoke Middle English and the people around them spoke Irish. A new group of English speakers came, but this time they spoke modern English. So the Middle English speakers in Dublin and Wexford were surrounded by modern English. So they were now an island distinct, very, very different. And it was, um, they shared vocabulary, even though they're not neighboring um, areas. This guy wrote about the Wexford dialect. The old Chaucer English is still there as well as Fingal. So everybody knew that these two dialect islands had preserved the old Middle English Chaucer. They survived for centuries. This went on for hundreds of years. Yola went on until 1850 speaking Chaucer English. Um, this is a map, Fingolian area. It's kind of the whole thing about gray area. Where does it end? So the pale is the area by the government officials with Dublin. So that would be the core of Fingolian, but it could stretch up along the East Coast. You've got East Dublin dialects or East Ireland dialects stretching all the way up into the North and all the way down. Um, so you can see where do you choose to call the dialect? Well, it, it depends how strict you are, what criteria you're going to use. I'll just go through this fast because here is some Fingolian. 
Rabin Arun, this is kind of from Irish that they borrowed. Vu, so they had Vu, which was the old vow. We're good for, and then the pronunciation. So there's some things there. Prior to the great vowel shift, they hadn't gone through that Middle English to Modern English change. And they had Vidout, which comes from Middle English. And they said D, and people in modern Dublin say this and that sometimes. So that is perhaps borrowed from, oh, has been brought because Fingolian spoke like that. And so the dialect never fully went away. So if you ask why Dublin speech might be different, it's always down to history, where the things came from. Um, leaf instead of life. So before the change in the vowels, some words there, prate. They had vow and dao and d, which is v and m for them. They also had these old past participles, ecom, ego, eclept, etc. And here is a poem from it. Fat, eor, ecri, eror, stress patterns and everything. So it looks kind of English, but Middle English, basically. And examples of Yola. Door, ver, ti na door, maybe from Irish. Your health, your hell. So this is like, uh, again, a Middle English um, dialect. So what happened? This would happen with all of these dialects that if they're that different, and if people start mixing more, they will merge with the surrounding modern English. This is known as leveling or de-dialectization. But some Fingolian words were still used in the middle of the 20th century and traces of the dialect. So housen, we have things like children and oxen in modern English, but housen was the n from the former old and middle English n. And that was still there in the 20th century. And another word there. <clears throat> Not as much in Dublin, but Yola had quite a lot. In the 1978, uh, a lot of words from um, that Middle English dialect. So that's in the late 1970s. Would you call it a dialect? Well, it's the variety spoken in South Wexford. There was a dialect there. The people there would be speaking a lot more standard English, but there'd still be a lot of words that they got from their old dialect. And then somebody looking at it would say, OK, there's a Wexford dialect because these words are used south of this line. This pronunciation is done that way. And here is a poem. I'll just go through this quickly. So this guy, his father's father was a Yola man. 1970s, they used to go down to visit the grandfather. And these are the words he used to use. An old man in the 1970s, queer hot day, zin be shining a hay, them bean in the treen. Remember the E-N thing? So even then people were talking in Middle English endings on some of their words. And there is just a kind of a poetic thing brought there by people from Somerset and Devon in the west of England to the sunny southeast and mixed with Gaelic, Irish, Flemish and Manx, another Gaelic language. Um, so have a look at that, what Fingolian features. We have vil, which is the, um, instead of will, prayer, which is prayer, and then leaf, and me leaf, which is the vowels. So you can see it's um, noticeably different from modern English. Yeah. Um, so when you want to describe a language, your decision is how many systems are there? How abstract or generalized? What do you do with all these dialects? And how do you cater for age, gender, or social class? Do you want to say only young people's language, only old people's language, or do you want to say all of the people's languages mixed in? Then you have to make allowances for um, that variety. So Chomsky is a theoretician, and his thing is that everybody speaks this perfect language and you can generate good sentences using rules. But the assumption is homogenous that everybody speaks the same. Dialects show that everybody doesn't speak the same. And then Chomsky would say, well, actually all of these dialects are separate languages with their own internal logic. Now, realistically, all the dialects would say would be part of English, but they might have their own separate rules. So it depends at what level you want to analyze this. So we have, um, I wonder which dish they picked. And then somebody in Belfast might say, I wonder which dish that they picked. The Belfast 
dialect. And somebody in Middle English, I would fain know how that ye understood these words. So Belfast has kept that that word there that they had in Middle English. And so if you want to do one of these uh, trees, and if you want to say English, including Belfast English and that Middle English thing, you would then have to allow for it. And so you do this tree, which is your subject, your predicate, and the internal sentence. And you, where it has that, you can say, well, sometimes you have that, depending on your dialect. In Belfast, you put in that. In standard English, you don't put in that. But the rest of the sentence is much the same. So these theoreticians would say, despite these surface apparent differences, the language does operate according to some rules. Universal grammar, exactly. And universal grammar looks for the things in common between all languages rather than the differences. So one last thing here, quantify a float. They have all gone to bed. They all have gone to bed. You can move that around in standard English. Some people in um, varieties of English, now we're gonna talk about one in the North of Ireland. What all did you get for Christmas? Who all did you meet? So you've moved the whole thing. Now, that wouldn't be standard English, but if you say, who all did you meet? What you mean is, who were all the people you met? All of your friends or whatever. But in West Ulster, you can actually split that. You don't have to say who all, you can say, who did you meet all? But you, and where, what did she buy all? But you can't say, the one with the asterisks are things you can't say. What did she buy in Derry at the weekend all, etc. So as it turns out with the universal grammar, you could do something like this and you can say, I can't move all to the very end of the sentence, but I can take bits out. And this is a bit like, who were you talking to? I can move just the who bit. So despite the apparent differences of a dialect and somebody might say, well, why are the rules like that? You can actually study it carefully and say, well, it actually follows the same rules as other dialects. It's just doing it differently. There are some patterns which seem to be standard for all languages. But uh, can I comment on something here? Sure. Can you do? Yeah. I, um, I don't think um, formal linguistics or the universal grammar would stand in front of the varieties that we have, the growing varieties that we have in English. I mean, there will be infinite numbers of trees and so on. There That's would be, why, yes. Um, yes. Universal grammar now is out outdated. I mean, yeah. Well, it's yes. Not, it's not used. And some people say, some people say Chomsky, I mean, he's been working for 60 years. His earlier th uh, work will be quite different from, from the modern work. So this is an attempt to try and find what's in common, whereas his earlier thing would be um, what, you know, that each dialect is its own language what should be, with its own. Yeah. Root. Yeah. Well, what, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's a different approach. You. Do you want to just look at but then you would have to say, what are all the parameters? When somebody learns a language or a dialect, they're sitting there getting all of these rules. How do they generalize the rules? And what do all languages have in common? And what do they have different? And how do you allow for the difference? But yeah, you're right. This is an attempt to kind of do trees that, that match all of the... Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm thinking of uh, yeah. doing trees for how people uh, speak. For example, in non in non standard uh, varieties, there are infinite number of how people can say just one sentence. For example, yeah. So there will be infinite number of uh, trees to do so. So it will not keep up with how people are speaking and so on. So yeah. you're right. And I mean, if you think of the Irish language, that starts with the verb. So this tree wouldn't work for Irish. Um, it's got verb, subject, yeah. object, order. And other languages might have great freedom of um, word order. So it depends on the option you choose. And a lot of these trees are kind of based on English. Um, uh, yes, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, you don't, you don't, you shouldn't feel constrained by these trees to say it has to be the way it's been uh, written in, like, like this in an English way. If the language you're studying does things different ways, then go with that. One of the rules yeah, of here. Course that all can't go after up the town. Up the town is your um, modifier. It's not a complement. So there is a pattern there that it has to stay within the verb phrase. And it, it's really just trying to show that dialects um, have some things in common, well, well, lots in common with their standards. Yeah, sorry, they follow a certain pattern. Yeah, I know, yeah, yeah. I know, yeah. Okay, thank um, you. 
Yeah, no problem. That's a very, very good question because you're right. I mean, this, why would you say that? Um, it just gives you the shape. It gives you a hint about what would you put into a different position. And you say, because in Belfast, yeah. you put in that, that's a good hint that perhaps we should put that in there in that tree. Um, yeah, one of the criticisms is trying to shoehorn things into categories and things. And the other thing is just go with the data, see what the data does. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Some very good questions. Um, how did you do, you, do you have any questions in general with that or any, any thoughts? Could you please uh, upload your uh, presentation on um, the Moodle? Yeah, I, I can put the um, slides up and the, the recording is, is um, I think, also going to go up. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Yeah, I hope, I hope it's useful for, um, it just, the main thing is, as you know, you've got the teaching side and then you've got the, the variety that exists. And you, you'll probably bump into this kind of variety in any text you look at. And then you just think about how did it get there? How did the language change that way? Yes. Uh, yeah. Very Excellent. Easy. Any other questions? It was very, it was very nice to meet you all. Anyway, and I, and I hope you got something out of. Um, that Thank you so much. This, this session was actually very, very informative. informative. Yeah. Yeah. Very Thank interesting. You. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you.